The British vehicle in the Gentleman's War box set can be built either as a Mark II or Mark IV Humber. I chose the Mark II variant because the earlier vehicle would be what the British or the Commonwealth had in the North African campaign, and that's kind of where my armies are set. Assembly starts with the turret, which is the only real visual difference between the Mark II and the Mark IV Humber. However, depending on which variant you choose, there's a different top plate on the vehicle body as well as a different insert that goes on the bottom of the turret. Note, if you go with the Mark II vehicle top plate, you can fit the Mark IV turret into the larger diameter hole. And yes, you do have enough parts to build the Mark IV turret and the Mark II turret. They are different shapes and have different hatches. The turret is basically six parts that make up a basic box. There are two sets of hatches that fit on the top side. I chose to glue them closed as I don't have figures to hide the lack of interior details. The autocannon and coax machine guns get glued to a manlet that then completes the front of the turret when you glue that on. With the turret completed, we now move on to the body, which is four parts for the top and sides. Fit is really good, with long positive engagement points that allow for the use of longer drying cements, which is critical to this operation. The vehicle's final shape is determined by the underbody panel, which runs the entire length of the Humber. This is why we use a longer curing cement. It allows for some adjustment of the side panels to fit the underbody without gaps. The front plate and the rear engine covers just slide into place once the final shape of the vehicle has been established. Once all that is glued up, you can come back in later and set the top side permanently in place and use a little extra thin wicking cement to glue that in place. The front and rear axles and drive shaft are a two-piece design that can only be installed one way, so it's pretty easy not to get this wrong. Then there are numerous boxes and bobbles that need to be added to complete the overall body of the Humber. But the two that really define the look are the externally mounted front shock absorbers and the large overhanging fenders. And again, these have pretty good keying points, so it's, it's hard to not get them glued on wrong. There are five wheels for this armored car, and the rear wheels have larger hubs, while the spare has a locking hub. The wheels are solid single pieces, so no assembly required. They mount directly onto the solid axles, so they do not turn and cannot be posed. But they do provide a robust game model that should handle all the stress that comes with the excess of handling during gameplay. Of interest is that there isn't a locating pin for the spare. So if you choose to use it, and really it is one of the coolest looks for this vehicle, you just need to make a good guess as to where you'd like it to sit on the finished kit. The very last bits are lots of little greebles, like storage and pioneering tools and rolled up blankets. You get to choose what to add and what to leave off, as only a few bits, like the hatch covers and lights, have dedicated attachment points. I added as much of the extra stuff as I could fit. I like the look of a recon vehicle that looks like it could self-support its crew for a week or so. Once all the glue cured, it was time for a white primer coat. I like to use primer coats. It gives the base color good adhesion, and it gives you an opportunity to set an undertone for the painting and weathering to come. For the top coat, I used Army Painter's Skeleton Bone, a nice off-white brownish color. I like that it's on the warmer side of a yellowish white brown, um, and using an airbrush with the white primer really helped get a solid uniform color application. Next up is a filter and a wash made from oil paints. I mixed up raw umber and lemon yellow combination until I achieved a light brown color, which was well thinned with odorless thinner. This was washed over the entire vehicle surface. I skipped the tires as they would be painted later a darker color. The wash was given about 30 minutes to evaporate some of the thinner and let the pigments settle into all that fine detail. I came back with cotton swabs. Starting with dry swabs, I used those to remove the excess from large flat areas, 
and later with thinner soap swabs to get into hard to remove tide marks or stubborn paint. The finished result is not only a subtle pin wash, but also a filter of brown over the skeleton bone base coat and it kind of darkens it up and makes it look the right color. After an overnight dry, I added some black camo. It's a very simple process that starts with mixing a German gray and a German brown camo together. This gives you a very dark, dark gray color with a hint of brown, so it's not a flat black. This helps to sell the black look of the camo without looking stark, which would happen if you use straight from the bottle flat black. I used a medium brush to outline the bold camo patterns, remembering that you really can't make a mistake unless you cover all the brown with the black paint. Then I come back and fill in between the lines to complete the camo pattern. I kept the camo to the front and sides with a little bit on top of the turret. Um, it kind of looks the way I've seen most of the photos out there, but I'm not sure why they did it that way. The tires were also painted with a black-brown mixture, closer to 50-50, to give them a rubber-like finish. After that paint was dry, it was time to add some edge highlights. This was achieved with an overall dry brush of pale sand. I kept it very, very, very light, as too much would spoil the illusion. The few decals that come for this British vehicle were added just before the chipping, which was achieved with a torn piece of makeup sponge dipped into the German gray paint straight from the bottle, and then I removed most of that paint by tapping the sponge onto a dry paper towel. Since the British had been in North Africa from the start of the Italian campaign, their painted vehicles were much better shaped than the German vehicles because the Germans brought everything down with their normal gray camouflage and then hastily just painted over them. But the British kind of purpose painted their vehicles to be in the desert. But we also know that Mother Nature and blown sand will chip any paint. After chipping with the sponge, I came back later with a brush and applied a few scratches to strategic places, like where the crew would walk. The last bit of weathering was to take some Iraqi sand colored paint and thin it way down past a wash level with tap water. I used something like 30 or 40 to 1 ratio to paint. This very diluted paint will wick off the brush and lay all over the armored car. And being so highly diluted, it will dry slightly chalky, which is what we want. This wash is used to simulate sand dusting the entire vehicle. So go as heavy or as light as you want. But remember, the heavier you go, the less the other weathering will stand out. Finally, I added the Humber to a flat piece of MDF to act as a base. I covered this with Vallejo's earth texture, desert sand, which also acted as a glue to hold the car to the base. After that was completely dry, I added some dead grass, tufts, and a few flowers just to kind of break up all that sandy color. And then I came back and painted the edges of the MDF base with English uniform. That way it matched the rest of the Commonwealth Troopers base rims. I hope you enjoyed this little video. I hope you learned something, and if you picked up a few extra tips or tricks, please consider a like and subscribe.